the one and only person who's going to be deciding our futures. I don't think so. So you have been everywhere in like the last that was, two months. That was a long trip, yeah. And it wasn't necessarily even in any particular order. You were in Rio, you were in Tokyo, you'd be in It was sort of like roughly east all the way around. Tried to be, tried to yeah. be. Um, what surprised you most? A, a lot. Uh, it's like a very special experience to just go talk to people that are like users, developers, also world leaders, interested in AI, like all day, every day for so long. You like really get an understanding of like what's going on and sort of subtle differences between places. But I think the biggest surprise was just the level of excitement, optimism, um, belief in the future and what this is gonna mean everywhere. Uh, it like, I kind of knew what it was like in the Bay Area and then it was like much more intense everywhere else. So more excitement than anxiety? D definitely anxiety too, right? like as there should be, you know, it's, it's you know, We've got to have both. Um, but just the thoughtfulness, the, the, the sort of like understanding of that nuance and the, the tension between the two, uh, that exists everywhere. And people's desire to really figure out how to drive economic and social progress with this tech and also like what it's going to take to come together as a planet to really make sure we avoid some of the downside scenarios was like quite sophisticated. How might you change your approach to the development of AI as a result of what you learned? Well, there, there's a bunch of like specific feedback. It took like more than 100 pages of notes from meeting with developers about complaints that people have uh, or things that they want. I saw you taking life. those handwritten notes out there. I take, yeah, I do handwritten notes. Um, and then, so, so that like there's all of that, and, and then there's sort of, you know, like the 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 way people want to customize the tools, the way people want to make sure their own values, culture, history, language are represented and what we have to do to enable that. So there will be a bunch of like specific changes we'll go make. Um, and then the, 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 like, the desire for the world to cooperate, um, like the number of world leaders who would say things like, I think this is really important, we want to get AGI right, like tell all the other world leaders like I'm in on it and we'll work together, like that just came up like, maybe every time but one. In the middle of the, all this, you signed a 22 word statement Warning about the dangers of AI. It reads, mitigating the risk of extinction from AI should be a global priority alongside other societal scale risks such as pandemics and nuclear war. Connect the dots for us here. How do we get from a cool chatbot to the end of humanity? Well, we're, gonna, we're planning not to. That's the hope. Like, you know, that's But the there's hope. also the fear. Um, I mean, I think there's many ways it could go wrong, but we, we work with powerful technology that can be used in dangerous ways very frequently in the world. Um, and I think we've developed over the decades good safety system practices in many categories. Uh, it's not perfect, and this won't be perfect either. Things will go wrong. Um, but I think we'll be able to mitigate some of the worst scenarios you could imagine. Um, you know, bioterror is like a common example, cybersecurity is another, I, there are like many more we could talk about, but um, as this technology, like the, the main thing that I feel is important about this technology is that we are on an exponential curve and a relatively steep one. And human intuition for exponential curves is like really bad in general. Um, it clearly was not that important in our evolutionary history. And, and so I think we have to, given that we all have that weakness, I think we have to like really push ourselves to say, okay, GPT-4, you know, not, not a risk like you're talking about there, but how sure are we that GPT-9 won't be? And if it might be, even if there's a small percentage chance of it being really bad, like that deserves great care. And if there is that small percentage chance, why keep doing this at all? Like why not stop? Um, I mean, a bunch of reasons. I, I think it's, a, I think that the upsides here are tremendous. The you know, opportunity for everyone on Earth to have a better quality education than, than basically anyone can get today. Um, that seems like really important and that'd be a bad thing to stop. Um, medical care and what's I think gonna happen there uh, and making that available like truly globally, uh, that, that's gonna be transformative. 
the scientific progress we're going to see. I'm a, I'm a big believer that like real sustainable improvements in quality of life come from scientific and technological progress, and I think we're going to have a lot more of that. So there are all the obvious benefits, and you know, like I think it'd be good to end poverty. Like maybe you think we should stop a technology that can do that. I personally don't. Um, but we got to manage through the risk to get there. I also think at this point, given how much people see the economic benefits and potential, um, no company could stop it. But global regulation, which I only think should be on these like powerful existential risk level systems, uh, global regulation is hard, and you you, you know you don't want to overdo it for sure. But I think global regulation can help make it safe, which is a better answer than stopping it. I also don't think stopping it would work. Let's talk about the global regulation. You've been around the world meeting with regulators. You met with President Biden and the CEOs of Microsoft and Google. And you're calling for regulation, but with some caveats. The critics say, it sounds like you're saying, regulate us, but not really. Or that you are calling for regulation in public, but lobbying for something else in private. How would you respond to that? Um, we're pushing for it in private, too. I mean, obviously, like, we have some opinions about the ways to do it that'll be effective and that'll be ineffective. We, for example, don't think small startups and open source models below a certain very high capability threshold um, should be subject to a lot of like regulation. We've seen what happens to countries that try to overregulate tech. I don't think that's what we want here. Um, but also, we think it is super important that as we think about a system that could be at a risk level like you were talking about, um, that we have a global and as a coordinated uh, response as possible. So we've been talking about that publicly, privately. I think it's really important. Y you know, you could like point out that it's, we're like trying to do regulatory capture here or whatever, but I just don't, I think that's like so transparently intellectually dishonest, I don't even know how to respond. There's also the skeptics view that you are building these relationships with regulators and it's going to box other startups out. That, that's what I meant by the, like, the regulatory capture piece. Like, like, we're saying explicitly you shouldn't regulate, and we'll say it again now, you shouldn't regulate small startups. They, it's a burden on them that we don't want as a society. What do you think about the certification system of AI models that the Biden administration has I, I think there's some version of that that's really good. Um, I think that people training models that are way above any, any model scale that we have today, but, but above some certain capability threshold, I think you should need to like go through a certification process for that. I think there should be external audits and safety tests. We do this for like lots of other industries where we care about safety. Elon Musk has said you started OpenAI, you both started OpenAI, because he was scared of Google. Is Google still a threat? Google is like unbelievably competent and it seems like they are focused with an intensity Google has not seen in a while on AI. So they're still scary? They're, they're they are a company that I don't think anyone should ever write off. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, we've seen all the barbs that you and Elon have been trading in public and in interviews. Trading? Do I don't really. Well, you're responding. You're responding. You get asked about it by people like me, to be fair. Mostly people like you, to be honest. To Most be other fair. people ask about the technology, but right. that is true. Why, why do you think he's so frustrated or disappointed with the direction that OpenAI has gone? Um, I mean, you should ask him. He can give you a better answer than I can speculate. So. But I, like, I really am happy to talk about this. If this is the most important yeah. topic, we can spend the rest of the time yeah. on it. Um, Don't worry. I, I Not think, the rest of the time, just some. <laughs> I think he really cares about AI safety a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where it's coming from a good place. And he just, like, you know, we have differences of opinion on some parts, but I think we both care about that. And he wants to make sure we have, like, the, we, the world, have the maximal chance at yeah. a good outcome. So you're not worried he's going to call you out, at a, call you to come to some cage match in, Ve in the Vegas octagon? I don't, I don't think I would do that. You just did with Mark Zuckerberg. But I kind of, I would go watch if he and Zuck actually did that. Like, All right, well, it's supposedly happening between him and Zuck. I, crazy. I think those, there will be quite an audience. Look, you know, there is, much has been made of the Microsoft relationship, and, and it's not just him, you know, uh, but he has said he's worried that Microsoft has more control than the leadership at OpenAI realizes and that they could 
cut you off at any time. Is that true? I mean, I think what he means is that they could like break the contract and you know take away our access to the data center. And a lot of money that you have access to, right? We have money. It's the data center that like they operate for us. I don't think that's a likely scenario for a bunch of reasons. Mm -hmm. How would you characterize the relationship with Microsoft? We think it's great. I, I mean, like any deep, complex relationship, it's not without its challenges, but it's really great. It is by far the best major partnership I've ever been a part of. Um, it's kind of like, on both sides, it was kind of a crazy thing to jump into, and it's yeah. uh, surprising that it works this well, but if you just like look at the results for both companies, we're, we're very happy. In 2018, that's the last time I believe we talked in person, um, you told me you thought AI would help us be our best, but also stop our worst impulses. What makes you confident about that? Because so many times, time and time again, it feels like technology has only amplified our worst. Yeah, and to be clear, like, it will do bad things too. Like, I don't have this, like, only good view of it. I'm, I think, realistic like other technologies. I think we, we it's human nature to talk about the bad more than the good. Um, and I think we can look at other technologies that have done a lot of good and plenty of harm and talk 99% about the harm and 1% about the good. And I do that too, like I think that's understandable. I think, so in 2018 that was like way before the GPT series was kind of a thing, you know, so at that point we didn't, we had some inkling it was gonna go like this, we certainly didn't know exactly. But I think now what we're heading to is this like personal tool that can help you in whatever way you'd like. And one of the fun parts of the trip was how diverse and broad the stories are of how people are using it to be better at whatever they want to be better at and to help them with things they want to improve. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like I think if you go talk to ChatGPT users, you'll find a lot of support for that comment from 2018. And you can also find people who are, you know, misusing it or unhappy with it. The reality check though is that you're building this on the back of human data. That is biased, that is racist, that is sexist, that is emotional, that is wrong. Like a lot of it is wrong. For sure. And how do you, Safeguard against that. There was a recent study that GPT-4, the model that is released, um, is like less biased on implicit bias tests than humans, even who are humans who think they've really trained themselves to be good at this. So I, if, you, if you look at the model that comes out of the pre-training process, that model will be quite biased and it'll reflect mm -hmm. you know, the internet. But um, reinforcement learning from human feedback, the tech, one of the techniques we use to align the models works quite well. And, you know, if you look at the progress from model to model, even like some of our biggest critics are like, wow, they've gotten quite a lot of the bias out of the model. And so I think models like this can be a force for reducing bias in the world, um, not for enhancing it. Now, there's questions about what if a user like wants to use the model in a very biased way? Like how much control do you give a user who decides like what the limits of the value system are and you know, that'll be a tough question for society to wrestle with. It, there's not like an obvious one sentence, neatly buttoned up answer. But the technology, I think, has gone much further than people thought it was going to in terms of being able to align these models to behave in certain ways. Um, you and I have been talking going all the way back to your looped days yeah. at, at YC. And it's been fun to watch that journey. I think people really want to understand your incentives and don't necessarily understand your incentives. People are perplexed. I've asked a lot of people what I should ask you. Okay. They're perplexed that you have no equity. Can you explain that a little? Like, is there any financial structure whereby you do benefit if open AI is a big thing? Yeah, I, I get why people are perplexed about this and I have like, wondered if I should just like take one share of equity so I never have to answer this question again. Um, a few things. One, we have, we're, we're governed by a nonprofit, of which I'm a board member, and our board has, needs to have a majority of disinterested directors, um, like who don't have equity in the company. Um, so I originally didn't do it for that reason, and then I was like, you know, I just, I don't think about it until right. I, you but are there any me. financial incentives, like at a certain benchmark? No. I mean, I have a tiny bit of exposure via the YC investment, 
but like it's immaterial. So the, to be clear, like if OpenAI, you know, is massively profitable, you won't well, benefit financially. One of the takeaways I've learned from questions like this <laughs> is that this like concept of having enough money yeah. is not something that is like easy to get across to other people. It's hard for people to understand. Hard um, for people to understand. But I like, I have enough money. I'm gonna make way, way more from other investments that yeah. I've made in the past. Like, in some, like if, if I had just like taken the equity and signed the giving pledge, people would be like, that's great, that makes sense. And it would have had the same net, I'm like pre-giving away the money here because it goes to the OpenAI nonprofit and I like trust the OpenAI nonprofit to do a good thing with it. But like, I have enough money. What I want more of is like an interesting life impact, like access to be in the room for interesting conversations. So I still get like a lot of selfish benefit from this. Mm. Um, like, what else am I going to do with my time? Uh, this is, like, really great. I cannot imagine a more interesting, like, life than this one and a more interesting thing to work on. So I get, like, a ton of benefit, but, yes, yeah, somehow this idea of, like, having enough money just doesn't compute for people. So if it's not about money, is it about power? Is it about control? I want to, like, make my contribution back to, you know, human technological progress. I get to benefit from all of this stuff that people did before. I, like, I get to use this iPhone that I still marvel at every day, all of the work that had to go into that in the human tech tree. And those people, I don't know who they are. I'm very grateful to them. Um, they knew they were like never gonna get recognition <laughs> from me personally, but they also like wanted to do something to contribute. And so do I, and I like can't imagine better like compensation than that feeling. Um, it would be like maybe weird if I had not already like made a bunch of money and again like plan to make way more from like other investments, but I just don't think about it. Yeah. Um, I think this will be like, I think this will be the most important step yet that humanity has to get through with technology. Um, and I really care about that. What is one question that you really wish People I want to like hear about Elon you. and equity <laughs> and, you know, like the personal drama of the day. But seriously, um, I understand you are getting a lot of those questions. No, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it. <laughs> I, one question. Like, I'm always excited to just talk about what can happen in the coming few years and few decades with the technology. So what are we all going to do when we have nothing to do? Uh, I mean, talk about Elon and Zuck. <laughs> like, seriously. I don't know. No, I don't, I don't think we ever run out of things to do. I, I think it's like deeply in our nature to want to create, to want to be useful, to want to like feel the fulfillment of doing something that matters. And if you talk to people from thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago even, the work that we do now would have seemed you know, unimaginable at best and probably like trivial. This is like not directly necessary for our survival in the sense of like creating food or whatever. And this shift happens with every technological revolution, every time we worry about what people are gonna do on the other side, and every time we find things. And I suspect not only will this time not be an exception to that, the things we find will be better and more interesting and more impactful than ever before. Like. There are a lot of people that talk about AI as like the last techno technological revolution. I suspect that, you know, from the other side, it'll look like the first. Hmm. Like it'll, the other stuff will be so small in comparison. I, I think the whole thing of like technological revolutions is sort of dumb because my understanding has always been that it's just one long continuous one, but it is this continuing exponential. And so what, what will be enabled and the stuff we can't even imagine on the other side, we will have way too much to do. If you want, if you want to just sit around and do nothing, that'll be fine too. Uh -huh. All right, all right, bonbons and beaches in my future, that's if what that's I what you, I don't think that's what you'll turn out to want, <laughs> but if you do, great. You talked about AIs designing other AIs on the tour. Can you play that out for us and the implications of that? Yeah, I mean, this is like the classic sci-fi idea that, you know, at some point, these systems can help progress themselves, can discover better architectures, can help write their own code. Uh, you know, I think we're a ways away from that, but uh, it is worth paying attention to. Yeah. China and Russia, you didn't go there on your trip. 
I did speak. I gave the keynote at the Chinese conference. You about, did speak virtually. Yeah. Where do you think they are on AI, and should we be worried? I don't really know. I'd love to have better information on that. I don't, I don't have a great sense. Does it concern you that we don't know? Yeah, I mean, again, like any imperfect information always is a little concerning. So I'd, I'd love to have a better sense. But, you know, I'm, I'm like optimistic that we can find some sort of collaborative thing. And I think, this, I think this thing that often gets said in the US, which is like it's impossible to cooperate with China, it's just totally off the table, is asserted as fact. And like people are trying to will it into existence. But it's like not clear to me it's true. In fact, I suspect it's not. Um, well, it would I'm, be hard. Right, right, right. Look, I'm so grateful that you've been around the world talking about this. I'm so grateful that you're with us today. I think even you would acknowledge you have an incredible amount of power at this moment in time. Why should we trust you? Um, you shouldn't. Like, uh, you know, I don't, as you, you know me for a long time. Um, public talking, like I'd rather be in the office working. I, I, but I think at this moment in time, like people deserve basically as much time asking questions as they want. And I'm trying to show up and do it. But more to that, uh, like no one person should be trusted here. I don't have super voting shares. Um, like I don't want them. The board can fire me. I think that's important. I think the board over time needs to get like democratized to all of humanity. There's many ways that could be implemented. Um, but the reason for our structure and the reason it's so weird and the, one of the consequences of that weirdness was me ending up with no equity is we think this technology, the benefits, the access to it, the governance of it belongs to humanity as a whole. Yeah. You should like not, if this really works, it's like quite a powerful technology and you should not trust one company and certainly not one person with it. So why should we trust OpenAI? Are you saying we shouldn't? No, I think, I think you should trust OpenAI, but only if OpenAI is doing these sorts of things. Like if we're, if we're you know, years down the road and have not sort of figured out how to start democratizing control, then I think you shouldn't. But if this is like, you know, if we figure out some sort of new structure where OpenAI is like governed by humanity, and that can happen in many ways, including like the alignment data set we pick rather than us picking it, we find a way to like get it from humanity as a whole. Um, that could mean like actual board control. There's many ways that could be implemented and we're talking to a lot of people about what that could look like. But if we don't do that, I don't, I don't think like just trust us is good enough. Well, thank you for explaining why we should maybe consider trusting you. Um, you have a plane to catch. We're so grateful thank for your time. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you so much. For sure.